Okay. Um, I think one of the one of the uh, obvious truths of the last uh, 250 years, uh, one of the most uh, you know astounding developments in the last 250 years is the fact that capitalism is the is the is the development of capitalism as a system that creates enormous amounts of wealth and it raises the standard of living of everybody who lives under it. And it, the evidence for this is just overwhelming. The evidence is historical, it's, uh, it's geographic, it's everywhere you look, you see the evidence that capitalism has worked. I mean, you can think of the last 250 years as a big experiment, an experiment in social economic systems. You know, what works, what doesn't work, what creates wealth, what doesn't create wealth. And we've tried almost everything in the spectrum from, we've tried communism and fascism, so we know what 100% statism, if you will, is. 100% control of the state. It leads to what? Death, destruction, and poverty. It just does, right? Tens of millions of people died under communism. And the people who were alive were good poor. So it's a complete and utter disaster. We tried capitalism. We tried, you know, maybe not as pure capitalism as I would like. Maybe we've never quite achieved that. But we got pretty close. 19th century America. But what happened? Well, we went from 1776, we were third rate British colony. Right? Not even worth putting the full force of the British army to fight us. Because we weren't that important. And within 140 years, we were the by far the strongest economy in the world, the mightiest military economic power in the world. By the, break, by, the, by the start of World War I, it was over. The United States was it. What happened in those 140 years? Well, we tried capitalism. We tried free markets. We let people alone for the most part. So, it's not kind of it's then you can, you can argue about what the particulars happen and you know all the awful stuff that supposedly capitalism does. But the fact is that we went from nothing to being this incredible economy during a period where government was what ten percent, five percent of the size it is today. You could cut ninety-five percent of all government spending today, and that's the size of government that we had during the nineteenth century. And it's no accident, in my view, that that's also the period in which we became this incredible economic power. But you don't even have to look at history. Um, we have tried, uh, over the last hundred years, we've tried all sorts of mixtures of socialism and capitalism. All these mixed economies, some more socialist, some more capitalist. And you can plot these on a graph, right? And you can plot the relative standard of living, wealth creation, GDP, growth per capita, all these things. And it's almost a perfect graph. Where the more capitalism, the more freedom, high standard of living, more wealth creation, greater GDP per capita. More socialism, more poverty, less wealth creation, worse off you are. Empirical evidence is right there. You can, you, you can, uh, there's an economic freedom index that uh, the two organizations, uh, one, one created by the Fraser Institute in Canada, one created by Heritage. And you can find these numbers and you can correlate them. And there's almost no question that economic freedom leads to good stuff. If you want another example, you can go to Hong Kong. I don't know if anybody is, you mean Hong Kong, Bob? I mean, yeah, Hong Kong is this amazing place. Right? 70 years ago, Hong Kong was a fishing village in the middle of nowhere on a rock that nobody really wanted, right? And all the British did was took over this rock and established the rule of law. They protected property rights, contracts. You couldn't vote, but your property was yours. Right? And guess what happened? Within those 70 years, today, you go to Hong Kong, it makes, you know, it puts New York to shame. Because they have these skyscrapers that are all modern and beautiful. We haven't built a skyscraper in New York in years. Seven and a half million people live on this rock. Seven and a half million people from nothing. And they came from all over Asia. You know, they, they risked their lives, they risked their families' lives to get to this rock. Why? No safety net, no distribution of wealth, no massive regulations. 
All they had was protection of property rights, and they were left alone. And they built something. Today, GDP per capita in Hong Kong, it's a standard of wealth, is equal to that of the United States. They went from nothing to one of the wealthiest countries in the world in 70 years with capitalism. As close to capitalism as we have in the world today, they rank one or two in economic freedom based on these indexes. Them in Singapore rank one and two in economic freedom. The United States, by the way, yeah, 12 years ago was number three. Anybody know where they are, where we are today? 18. 18. So according to Economic Freedom Index, Denmark, Canada are freer than the United States. Socialist Canada is more economically free than we are today in the, in, in the US. According, now these indexes are imperfect, but that gives you a, a sense of a trend, right? And the trend is clearly towards statism, bigger and bigger government, more and more regulation. So this is this is the puzzle that we try to you know untangle in the book that we just wrote. Here you've got the system that creates wealth, raises people out of poverty, the poor are better off under capitalism than under any other system. I mean, I, I visited Cambodia a few years ago, and you go to Cambodian villages and you see poor people. I mean, nobody in America is poor on that scale. They have no electricity, no running water. Right? I mean, here, 90 plus percent of poor people in the United States have televisions, automobiles, air conditioning. Now, I'm not saying they're not relatively poor, but in absolute terms. So capitalism raises the standard of living of, of pretty much everybody, creates huge amounts of economic wealth, and yet, and yet, for the last, I would argue, 100 years, we in the West have turned our back on it, have been drifting towards socialism. Even though we know socialism, we should know, socialism is a complete failure when it comes to material wealth. So the question is why? I mean, it's not that these economic political factors are so obscure, so difficult to figure out, that it takes some PhD in economics in the country. I think the more educated in economics you become, the stupider you become. Right? Just look at Paul Krugman. <laughs> it's like the more the more you just look out into the world, the more you just observe, the more straightforward it is. Freedom works, statism doesn't when it comes to economic activity. So why are we moving away from freedom towards, towards statism? And we are for a hundred years, no matter who gets elected, Democrats or Republicans, it doesn't matter. Government only grows. Government spending, which is a proxy for the amount of government in our lives, only grows. It's, it's done nothing but grow since 1920s. Right? That's 90 years. You know, conservatives are like, oh, but Ronald Reagan was great. Oh, Ronald Reagan, government spending under Ronald Reagan, the eight years Ronald Reagan was president, government spending doubled. Now that was good because the previous eight years, it had tripled, but it still doubled. Government grew. Government intervention in our lives grew. That money goes to somewhere. It either gets redistributed or it pays bureaucrats to supervise what we do with our lives. So over the last hundred years, it's actually exactly hundred years because I think the real, real big push of statism came in 1913. We got two Big things, anybody know what happened in 1913? Federal Reserve. Federal Reserve is one. What's the second one? Income tax. Income tax was ruled unconstitutional by Supreme Court after Supreme Court after Supreme Court. You know what we did? We changed the Constitution. 16th Amendment allows for raising taxes on income. Of course, today the Supreme Court would rule the Constitution, so you wouldn't need that. But 16th Amendment makes it official, right? It's not part of the Constitution. So 1913 is a good date. You could argue it started early in 1890 uh, with antitrust, and we can talk about antitrust if you have any questions on that. But you could, you could argue 1890, but certainly 1913 is the beginning of kind of this, this moving away. And you see it all over the world. You see it in Europe, moving more and more and more towards stages, and even though they have first-handed experience with communism and fascism and all these things, they're still moving in that direction. I was just in the Czech Republic this summer, and uh, 
I was at a conference, and one of the people at the conference was, actually still is, he's, until the end of March, he's still the president of the Czech Republic. Right? And, and the president of the Czech Republic is a huge capitalist. He's a, he's, a, he's a huge fan of free markets. And I thought, this will be good. This will this will uh, give me some optimism, right? Because because he'll he he lived under communism. How pessimistic could he be, right? He's seen what communism is. He was part of the of the Velvet Revolution that overthrew the communists. And now he's the president, so he must be optimistic. Well, it turns out this guy was unbelievably depressing. Because what he was saying was, we witnessed communism, we came out of communism energized and positive and, and thinking we could change the world and now what we're seeing is we're slipping back down that road and Europe is just moving in that increased government more controls more regulations statist growth of the state and he, he was unbelievably depressed and this is a guy you should be incredibly optimistic because he knows he's, he's been on the dark side and come out of it so the whole West is moving in this direction. You know, maybe Asia is maybe Asia is the one area of light in the world today where they seem to have some respect for capitalism. Some, because in many respects they look at us and they say, "Well, we want to mimic the welfare state that is Europe and is the United States." They're taking an example from us moving leftwards, moving towards statism. So the fundamental question is why? Why is it? And it's not that we don't understand the economics of capitalism. We've had great economists who explain it, they won Nobel Prizes, who explain why capitalism works, right? Whether it's Milton Friedman, or F.A. Hayek, or, or you know, von Mises, there have been lots of really great economists who explain not just the empirical fact that markets work, which I think is evident to anybody with eyes, and somewhat of a brain, but the theory behind it, why it actually functions. We know that markets work better than governments. In markets, governments are a disaster with the anti markets. And there are lots of reasons for that. Again, we'll talk about that in the QA. But so it's not that. There's something more fundamental. There's something more basic that causes our society to reject capitalism, to reject free markets. So, what is it? What is it that capitalism, that it, that, what is it about capitalism that's so repugnant that every time there's a crisis, every time something bad happens to the economy, who do we blame? Before the data's even in, before we know anything about what's going on, who do we blame instinctually? Capitalism, we blame markets, we blame bankers. Bankers are favorite, favorite enemy. Right? Having, for 2,000 years, I would argue, bankers have been the villain. We've always been bankers. I mean, who, who caused the Great Depression? Well, speculation on Wall Street, of course. Now, if you know economics, no serious economist actually believes that anymore. Right? Who caused the Great Depression based on serious economists as well? The Federal Reserve messed up, Hoover messed up, and FDR messed up. And they just dug us deeper and deeper into the Great Depression. It's a government messed up. That's not what they teach you in high school, I'm sure. Right? You're taught that it was markets gone amok, right? It was speculation. But, but that's empirical, just not true. You know, you have to ask yourself, why do markets go amok suddenly? Well, it turns out that if you flood markets with money, cheap money, people misbehave. But it's the cheap money that usually causes that. You know, the same thing with the financial crisis right now. What caused the financial crisis right now? Well, if you, if you read the headlines, it was Capitalism, greed. Suddenly, Wall Street discovered greed. Right? For 80 years, there was no greed on Wall Street. In the mid 2000s, somebody discovered greed and they became really greedy and they destroyed the financial markets. I mean, that's ridiculous. Greed is always on Wall Street. Greed is part of business, right? We'll talk about that in a minute. Greed in the sense of wanting to make more. But what happened in the 2000s? Well, it has nothing to do. With greed, it has everything to do with the incentives created by regulations, everything to do with the Federal Reserve keeping interest rates below the rate of inflation for two and a half years. We call that in finance a negative real rate of return. Guess what happens? If you, if you keep the, the rate of interest below the rate of inflation, you're basically paying people to borrow money. Guess what people do if you incentivize them to borrow money? 
If you incentivize people to do pretty much anything, what do they do? What do you incentivize them to do? If you incentivize people to borrow money, what do they do? They borrow money. And we borrowed money like crazy in the 2000s because interest rates were artificially kept really low. And then why did it all go into housing? Because we were heavily subsidizing it. So not only were interest rates low, but then we subsidized everybody's mortgage through Freddie and Fannie and the Federal Home Loan Bank. And they're, they're like multiple agencies responsible for making sure you guys all have a home. And you buy. God forbid you rent. And even worse, if you pay off your mortgage. I always like to ask audiences, it's not fair with students, how many of you rent? I assume you live living dorms or you rent, right? Yeah. And then how many of you pay off your mortgage? Right? Some, some people paid off their mortgage. Right? And I always thank the audience, thank you, because all of you are subsidizing my taxes. I've got a huge mortgage. I get to deduct it from taxes. You don't get to deduct your rent from taxes. You have nothing to, you paid it off. So you get penalized. You get to pay more taxes for that. We have this crazy, insane housing policy that incentivizes us to take on debt, <coughs> and then subsidizes that debt so that we all get into homes. Because you know, under the Carter administration, they set a uh, not Carter, the Clinton administration, they set a goal to get 70% of all Americans into homes that they own. I don't know what it means to own a home where you have a 90% mortgage on it, but anyway, <laughs> you know, you're gonna own, you're gonna have that deed to the home, right? 70%. It used to be historical trends are somewhere between 63 to 65%. Canada, that has no Freddie, no Fannie, no housing policy, no incentive, no deduction of the mortgage interest, nothing, has 65% home ownership. It's kind of an equilibrium, it turns out kind of an equilibrium rate. So they pushed for 70%. During the peak of the bubble, we reached something like 68.5. Right now we're below 65 because of all the foreclosures. Yeah, so what caused this crisis? I would argue three, you know, three basic things. There are lots of things, but uh, Federal Reserve policy, housing policy, and the way in which we regulate financial institutions and provide an incentive too big to fail, an incentive to take on excessive risk because the upside is all yours. The downside is, you know, if I have an upside that's all mine and the downside is all yours, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to take on lots of risk and take the upside. And when I, when I go crash, because when you take on a lot of risk, what does risk mean? That once in a while you crash. Otherwise, risk is meaningless. And when I'm going to crash, you guys pick up the bill. Because you have picked up the bill. All of you have picked up the bill for, the, for, for what, you know, whatever risk-taking Wall Street did. But they were incentivized to do it. Again, when you incentivize people to behave in a particular way, most of the time, that's exactly how they behave. Because part of the problem is that if you're on Wall Street and you don't play the game, right, take on these risks that government is incentivizing you to do, you are at a competitive disadvantage during the upside. Yeah, long term you'll benefit, but in the short term you're penalized. So everybody drifts towards the short term. And again, this is government, yeah, this is not how markets work. Markets don't create these weird asymmetries in markets. You get the upside, but what happens on the downside? You pay. You suffer. There's no markets are very good at penalizing failure. This is not a marketplace where we have market. So this crisis was got, in my view, government from beginning to end. Everywhere you pee all the on there, there's a government regulation, a government control, a government thing that spurred the particular behavior that you're looking at. And yet. Nobody spoke up in 2008, 2009 and blamed government. Everybody blamed <coughs> the market. So what is it about markets, free markets? What is it about markets we don't like, that we resent? What are markets about? That's your question. What are markets about? Profits and loss. Profits and loss. Is anybody going in business to make a loss? So what are people going to business for? Money. To make money. To make a profit. Now, is it only money? I mean, Steve Jobs, you know, built these, right? And, and he was in it for the money. These things had profit margins of what? First iPhones had 60% profit margin. If he really cared about me, he would have sold it cheaper. But he didn't, right? But what else? I mean, you can't say Steve Jobs was just about the money. Right, what else? Why did Steve Jobs do it? He loved doing it. This was his passion. He loved beautiful things. He loved waking up in the morning thinking of cool stuff that he could build. 
itself. But it was all about whom? Me? Who is this about? Steve Jobs. This is about Apple. And when I went and bought my first iPhone, like 2008, the economy spiraling out of control, uh, I did it because I wanted to stimulate the economy. Because <laughs> right, that's why you guys go to the mall. You go to the mall, you go shopping because you want to make sure everybody has a job. And you can, no, I mean, why, why, why do you go to the mall? Because you want something. Because you want, you want to be cool, you want, you want something pretty, you want something that will make you more productive. But it's about whom? It's about you. So what is the marketplace? What's a marketplace about? It's about people doing what? Consuming. Well, consuming on the one side and producing on the other side. But why do we consume and why do we produce? Individual interest, another way of putting that. What are we going out there to pursue? Our own self-interest. The marketplace is about people pursuing their own self-interest. All markets place are about that. You go, you go to an ancient, you know, go to go to food market, right? And people are haggling over a pound of tomatoes. Well, the buyer wants to get the best deal he can, and the and the vendor wants to make as much of a profit as he can. And they're, but they're each about what? Is either one of them considering the well-being of society? No. Markets are not about that. Markets are about people, individuals, going out there to pursue their own self-interest. I mean, Adam Smith understood this. Now, Wealth of Nations, famous book, first real economics textbook, a book, right? Uh, and uh, written, anybody know when it was written? 1776, easy date to remember, uh, right? And in, in, in the Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith says, the baker bakes the bread, not because he loves you, not because he cares about his customers in any deep sense. What's he trying to do by baking the bread? Make a living for himself. He feed his family. He's being self-interested. And the guy who delivers the bread to the grocery store, he cares about you, he cares about the grocery store, he cares about the bacon out. He only cares about them because they are means to what? To him making a living for himself. Markets are about self-interest. They're about people pursuing their own self-interest. And we do that by trading, right? Right? So, when I buy the iPhone, who lost? Well, nobody. Well, I'm better off. I paid 300 bucks for this. What's it worth to me? No, it's not worth 300 bucks. I would have got out of bed if it was just worth exactly 300 bucks, right? It's worth more than 300 bucks to me. That's why I'm willing to give up something to get something more valuable, right? So, it's worth more to me than 300 bucks. Now, what's it worth to Apple? More or less than 300. Less. They make a profit. So, who lost? Who won? Everybody. The beauty of trade is that it's win-win. So we all pursue our self-interest, but by doing that, we all win. And yet, what are we taught about self-interest from when we're this big? What are we told? Should be selfish. Yeah, and what do we mean by selfish? Do we mean taking care of self? No, what do we mean? I have to share everything, but what, 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 what kind of behavior do we associate with being selfish? We, but that's just another word. What, what's the behavior? What, what, what attributes do people have? Who, if you look at a kid and you say, that kid's over there, he's selfish. What do you mean? He's a bully. He's a cheater. He'll lie, steal, and cheat. He'll do anything in his power to get what he wants. Right? That's what we have as a mental image of self-interest. And what are we taught is good? Sharing, right? Sharing. I mean, how many, how many of you in the sandbox were, were told by your parents to trade? Oh, you're, an ex you're a weird exception. <laughs> no, that's great. To trade or to share? Oh, share, sorry. Yeah, share. I was wondering. I never get a hand anybody raised the name. <laughs> My kids are probably the only aberration out there. <laughs> Johnny, you know, Johnny wants your truck. You have to share it. You're not saying, you, nobody tells you, well, trade, see what he has that he can offer you in return. Right? And it's, it's funny because, uh, you know, Johnny in the, in the sandbox knows that if a stranger comes up to mommy and asks for the car keys, she ain't sharing. 
why is that? So why is it that we're not willing to shave, but we want our kids to shave? It's because we project our ideals in our kids. We, we're cynics. We're not gonna, you know, we sharing, that's not realistic, that's not practical, right? But ideal, the ideal world, the utopia out there, is still communism, some form of communism where everything is shared. Remember John Lennon's song, Imagine? Right? That's still how uh, imagine there's no property, right? That's what he says. I mean, that's still kind of in some deep sense. What we really believe is the ideal, even though it killed hundreds of millions of people. It doesn't matter. It's still kind of, oh, they, you know, communism, communism is a noble idea, it just was practiced bad. Right? Deep down in our culture, we believe that. Because we've grown up sharing, but it's not just sharing. What else have we been taught? What, what is noble? What is moral? What is good? To be what? If selfish is bad, what is the opposite of selfish? Selfless. I mean, I grew up in a good Jewish household, and I was taught when I was very young, think of yourself last. Think of others first. Sacrifice, that's nobility, that's goodness. Sacrifice, selflessness, giving, right? That's, that's goodness. Now, my mother didn't mean it. Right? That's the thing about morality that we're taught. Nobody actually means it, right? Because she wanted me to be successful, and she wanted me to pursue my own self-interest. But you can't say that, because that goes against everything we've been taught that is morality. Morality is selflessness. That's what we be taught. And selflessness is not capitalism. We're not selfless in capitalism. We're self-interested in capitalism. And there's a conflict there. Think about Bill Gates, somebody like Bill Gates. Bill Gates makes tens of millions of billions, sorry, tens of billions of dollars for himself. Right? Now how does he do it? By doing what? By doing what? Yeah, and selling products and trading. So is anybody worse off because of Bill Gates? <clears throat> I would argue that billions of people, everybody on the planet pretty much, is better off because of Bill Gates. Everybody. Because he revolutionized computing. He revolutionized what it meant. He made tens of billions, but the world made trillions. I'm better off for Bill Gates, even though I'm a, a, I've been using Apple since 89. I'm still better off because of Bill Gates. I've been using wood, Excel. They're worth more than 100 bucks I spent on them. Otherwise, I wouldn't have done it. Every human being on the planet was touched by it. Yet, how much moral ethical credit does Bill Gates get for creating Microsoft? None. He gets some, he gets some negatives, right? It's greedy, made too much money. How can any one individual have $16 billion? When does Bill Gates become a good guy? When he leaves Microsoft and he starts to give it away. So giving, that's good. Making, eh. Not so much. Creating, building, not so much. Why? Is this not morally good? It's not morally good because he benefited from it. That's why it's not morally good. He's being self-interested. But when he gives it away, we don't see the benefit. He might be having fun doing it, so there might still be a benefit, but we don't see it. So it's not in our face in terms of money. How could we make Bill Gates a saint? I haven't talked to the Pope. They're, they're shifting folks right now, so that's who to talk to. But how would you how would you make Bill Gates a saint? He would have to give it all away, move into a tent, and if he could show some blood, right, some sacrifice, some real pain, then he said, "Wow, I mean, nobody wants to be that way." It's kind of ridiculous that he gave all his money away, but wow, right? Ethically, morally, they're going to be teaching him in case studies after case study in ethics classes all over the world. He's going to be the model saint. So think about this. We have an economic system that works. It creates wealth. It creates a standard of living. But it is the exact opposite of our ethical code. Our ethical code is about giving. It's about sharing. It's about distributing. It's about sacrificing. It's about selflessness. That sounds like what? What, what economic system does that sound like? Socialism. Communism. Right? That sounds like socialism. Give. We distribute. Whereas capitalism is about making, creating, building, <coughs> benefiting, 
trading. But we don't value that. Not ethically. We all want to be that. We all kind of... And that, and that creates an interesting conflict inside of us, right? We all want to be Bill Gates. But we all think Mother Teresa is the real saint. Right? So we should be Mother Teresa. But we want to be an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley making millions and millions of dollars. What does that create inside of you? Not when you're young. You're too young for this, right? But like, you know, later on in life, when you look back at your life and you say, you know, I shouldn't be Mother Teresa. That's what I was taught by everybody, by my professors, by my preachers, by my mother, that that is the real ideal. But I spend my life making money. What do you think that creates inside? It's an emotion. It starts with G. Guilt. Guilt. Right? You live a life that was not the ideal. It was not, right? You were self-interested. And most philanthropy today in America is driven not by value, but driven by that guilt. Because what are people trying to do? They made a lot of money, and now they're trying to buy themselves into heaven. You know, by being, by portraying themselves at least, as being selfless. So I, I was at a, a, a luncheon award for business leaders, right? This was in, um, so nobody can accuse one of them. This is an example of liberalism. This was in ultra-conservative South Carolina. Charleston, South Carolina, it was at a, a, a luncheon where they were celebrating lifetime achievement of business leaders. And each, they would come up and they would have these long introductions of these guys. Ten minute introductions. And they would spend one minute on the incredible business success and nine minute on the charity and community service. Where do you think business leaders have more impact on the world, in their charity or their business? By far. There's no comparison. I'm not against charity. Charity's great. But is that what defines you? Is that where you really have an impact on the world? Bill Gates has, through his business, touched every human being on the planet. Yeah, I mean, he'll save some kids from malaria in his charity, and that's a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But he's had, by factors of thousands, more impact through Microsoft on people's lives than he ever will in his charity. And yet the charity gives them all credit, the business gets a zero wrong. You even see this, in, you know the micro-lending, you probably all heard of micro-lending, they go to poor countries, they give these small loans. Well, there are two business models for micro-lending. One is a not-for-profit model, and the other is a for-profit model. Not surprising, the for-profit model tends to be more successful in terms of actual generating you know, business activity among poor people. But what do you think gets the mall credit? The not-for-profits look down on the profit model. Ooh, they're greedy, they're users. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to, they're leeching off of the poor, even though the benefits are right there in their face. They're leeching off of the poor. And, and where does the Nobel Prize go? Right? The Nobel Prize goes to the guy who runs the not-for-profit, not the guy who runs the for-profit, even though the guy who runs the for-profit is probably the biggest success. So it's actually impacting the lives of people. We resent self-interest. We resent, as a consequence, profit. And therefore, it doesn't matter to us whether something works or doesn't work. People don't vote their pocketbook. People don't vote their economic interest. If they did, Obama would have never got elected, certainly not in the second time. They don't vote what's good for them economically. People vote what they think is right, what they think is just, what they think is fair, what they think is good. Capitalism is not good, it's not just, it's not fair. That's what we've been taught. And therefore we have to vote against. Think of it in the two aspects of, of kind of big government um, that this relates to. One is the entitlement state, you know, redistribution of wealth. And the second is the regulatory state. So think in terms of the entitlement state. How does the entitlement state come about? Well, there's a group over there, and they're really poor, and they don't have good health care. And you guys aren't helping them. You've got money, and you're not helping them. I mean, maybe you're giving a little bit of charity, but obviously these people still need better health care, and you guys haven't helped them. So I, as president, am just going to ask you to help them a little bit more. And since you won't do it voluntarily, I'm just going to force you to do it. I'm going to raise your taxes to help them. And what are you going to do? You're not going to object. You're going to say, yeah, you're right. 
I'm not giving them enough. So if I need to be forced to be a good person, so be it. And you see this. And then, of course, there's one group of poor people, right? And so we, we subsidize their health care, whatever. But then there's other people over here who don't quite get as good a health care as everybody else. And then, so we have to subsidize them because we subsidize the first group. And, we, and, and they're still in need. And we, this morality of selflessness says their need is a claim on you. Your job is to sacrifice for them. How can you say no? How can you vote against that? And then there's another group and another group, but soon enough, 50% of Americans are being subsidized. And nobody stands up and says no. Nobody says that up and says enough. Why? Because you'd be selfish if you did that. You'd be self-interested. And that's immoral. Morality drives all of this. How many, how many do you think, how many uh, of the wealthiest counties in the United States, how many do you think voted for Obama? The top 10. How many do you think voted for Obama? Now, understand what it meant to vote for Obama if you're, if you're very wealthy. It meant that for sure your taxes were going up. If you want your personal taxes, not in a theoretical sense, not in some abstraction, you were going to pay more taxes. And yet, how many of these people actually voted for Obama? Of the top 10 counties, richest counties in America. This is, this is the whole mythology of the 47%, is that people vote their class. People don't vote their class. Of the top 10 counties, richest counties in America, eight voted for Obama. Eight. So rich people all over America voted to have their taxes raised. I mean, we live in a state where we just did that, right? And I bet you that most people earning more than $250,000, the people affected by the tax increase, voted for the tax increase, voted for Prop 30. Why? Why would people vote to have their income taxes increase? Because they feel morally responsible for those people over there who are suffering who need the money. Morally responsible. It's not economics, it's all about morality. If people voted their pocketbook, we'd be living capitalist heaven right now. Because that's what's good for your pocketbook. It's freedom. It's lower taxes, lower government spending, and economic freedom. So you tie them into completely driven by this morality. Now let's think about Let's think about the regulatory state. How is it influenced by this? You know, you go into one of the buildings on campus and you walk into an elevator and you see a little uh, certificate on the wall of the elevator that says that a government bureaucrat inspected the elevator and assures you that it's safe. Signs. And I always go, oh, good. No, I'm not going to die in this elevator. <laughs> because we know that in a pure free market, what would happen to the elevators? They'd be falling all the time. Because the best way to make money in a free market is to kill your customers. We need government inspectors to inspect elevators. Otherwise, they kill us. But that's what we assume. All regulations, all of them, again, why do we have, why do we give, you know, all these food inspectors? Because we know that if without food inspectors, McDonald's would sell us tainted food. Because that's how they make money, by making us sick. And you say that to somebody in business, and they go, what? That's ridiculous. But that whole regulatory state is built in there. So what's the assumption behind it? The assumption is businessmen left on their own are self-interested. Self-interest equals lying, stealing, cheating. Therefore, if we leave them alone, what will they do? Lie, steal, and cheat. So what do we need to do? We need to supervise them. We need to regulate them. We need to control them. We need to look over their shoulder all the time to make sure that they don't lie, steal, and cheat. And the best example of this was, um, you guys probably don't remember, but in, in like 2000, there was a bunch of cases of fraud, right? Enron, WorldCom, it's kind of, you were like, what, 12 or something. Um, but all these cases, and they caught these guys, and they were gonna send them to jail. But that wasn't enough. There was a certain assumption in the culture that this was just the tip of the iceberg, that indeed every CEO in America was tainted that there was a lot of fraud out there, that they were all crooks. I remember I was on Bill, you know Bill O'Reilly? Fox. I was on Bill O'Reilly in the spring of 2002. And Bill O'Reilly, if you want to know what people are thinking, just watch Bill O'Reilly, because he's, he's a figure in the wind, and that's, you know, he's very much a, a populist. Bill O'Reilly wanted to fire every CEO in America, because they were all crooks. So I went on to defend CEOs. I said, you know, in this country, you're innocent until proven guilty. And no, these guys are not crooks. Everything we have around us is a consequence of some company with some CEO building and producing and creating stuff. 
but he wanted them all fired. And it wasn't just Bill. This was a real sense in the culture. So what did Congress do? Congress passed something called Sarbanes-Oxley. One of the most disastrous regulatory bills in history. That basically, you know, without getting any technical, right, placed a little government bureaucrat on every businessman's shoulder looking at the books. Right? Mountains of regulations on how to do accounting, how to do communications within a company. It just created this enormous burden in America. As you could argue that IPOs after that, the, the, the initial public offerings in Silicon Valley, crashed immediately after that because becoming public was such a huge burden. American companies were going public in London and in Singapore rather than doing it here because of this accounting accounting disaster. It, it, by some estimates, it cost the US, the US economy $1.5 trillion of GDP, which is a huge number. Why? Why do you do that? Because we know they're all crooks. We just need the mechanisms to catch them. How many crooks the sarbanes oxley caught? Zero. Did it prevent the financial crisis? No. How many, how many conservatives, so-called conservatives, voted against it in the, in the Senate? 98 to 0, this bill passed. 98 to 0. Why? Because we don't trust CEOs. We don't trust businessmen. Because they're self interested. And if you look at regulation after regulation after regulation, most of them are there in order to protect poor consumers from greedy, exploitative businessmen, in order to protect shareholders from greedy, exploitative businessmen, because bureaucrats know better than shareholders how to supervise managers. Regulation after regulation after regulation are there to control the self-interest of business. This is morality. This has nothing to do with economics. <coughs> I mean, I would argue you cannot make a pro-economic argument for regulation. It's only a moral argument. So the fundamental question here is, is self-interest equivalent to lying, cheating, and stealing? Because notice that the people who control the dialogue about ethics in the world today offer us only two alternatives. You can be selfless, self-sacrificial, place the well-being of others first, Mother Teresa, nobody lives this way, but we all get to feel guilty as a consequence. Which is, by the way, an incredibly, I mean, it's important to know, I don't know how many of you grew up in uh, Jewish or Catholic households, but Jewish and Catholic mothers figured this out a long time ago, that guilt is an incredible, powerful tool to control people. It is. And politicians know this. So you create an ethical system that nobody actually lives up to except maybe Mother Teresa. And now you've got everybody. You've got them because they're all feeling guilty and you get a control. So that's the ethical system. That's one alternative, right? And that's goodness, and that's virtue. And the alternative is lying, stealing, and cheating, which is what they define as self -interest. That's it. Those are the two alternatives. Now, that's ridiculous. But that's how it's presented. Right? The only third alternative is who cares about ethics, which is what they teach in business ethics courses in business school. I, I, took, I, I taught a class in ethics and finance. I mean, what you're taught in ethics and finance is in, in, uh, in business ethics schools is this. It's exactly this dichotomy. What you're taught is this. Profit is self-interested. So that can't be good. What's really noble and good is to serve the community and stakeholders and be socially responsible. But to do that, you have to make a profit, because otherwise you won't have money to serve them. So it's OK to make a profit, but only if you use that profit to serve the community and, and your stakeholders. And that's it. That's business ethics. You don't have to take the class anymore. You just and don't, oh, this was the one principle I got out of business ethics. Don't do anything you wouldn't want to be on the front page of the New York Times tomorrow. That's the only ethical guidance I got. Now, I argue, we argue in the book, Ayn Rand argues, that there is a third alternative. And that is a proper definition of self-interest. Because if you think about it, is lying, stealing, cheating in your self-interest? How many of you have ever lied? Oh, God. <laughs> um, it doesn't work. It usually gets you into more trouble than you were trying to avoid by doing it. It's, it has, the more you do it, the more disastrous the consequences are. It's a stupid strategy for living. 
it doesn't work. Uh, you know, ask Bernie Madoff. You know Bernie Madoff, German scheme guy. Right? He lied, and it was a disaster. He and it wasn't like for a while he enjoyed his money. He never enjoyed his money because he was always afraid of being caught, and he wasn't afraid of being caught by the police. That was the least of his worries. He was afraid of being caught by his best friends, by his family. You know who turned Bernie Madoff in? His sons. I mean, can you imagine something more horrific in life? that your son's having to call the police on you? He says that he's happier in jail now than he was before he was caught. And I believe it. Because human happiness and lying and cheating and stealing are not compatible. They don't work. People try. We've got plenty of empirical evidence. It doesn't, there's no connection between the two. Indeed, I would argue that you cannot be happy if you lie, steal, and cheat. And that happiness requires the exact opposite of it. What is, our, what is the main thing that allows us to succeed and thrive in the world? If you think about the human being, human beings. What is the one tool that we have, the one capacity we have that makes it possible for us to succeed in life? What's that? Yeah, I mean, cheetahs fulfill their desires. Uh, you know, yeah, but it's every biology. What's what's unique to us? I mean, if you look at your neighbor, right? You can look. Um, we're pretty pathetic. <laughs> we're weak. We're slow. We have no claws. We have no fangs. You go out there, try chasing down a bison and biting into it. You put you in a, a saber-toothed tiger in a cave. Who do you think is going to win? And yet. In spite of the fact that, as a biological entity, we are so weak, we if we thrive. Why? What is it that we have? Reason. Yeah, our minds, our reason, our capacity to reason. Everything, everything good in our <coughs> world around us is a product of reason, and that includes the arts. The arts do not exist without human reason, without a capacity to be rational, understand the world around us, observe, integrate. Think about, figure out, solve problems. It's all about our minds. <coughs> now what does lying do to your mind? This is why lying is so disastrous. You know the term in computers, garbage in, garbage out? Well think of your mind as a computer. What's a lie? It's, a lie. it's nonsense. It's not true. What, is, what does reason depend on? It depends on facts, on what actually happens. When you put in non-facts, Guess what the result is going to be? Bad. It doesn't work. So it turns out that lying, cheating, and stealing are not self-interested. Bernie Madoff was not a self-interested person. He wasn't selfish. He was stupid. He was self-destructive. Bernie Madoff did not sit down one day and say, huh, I wonder how I can be the best human being I can be. I wonder how I can achieve incredible happiness and flourishing and fulfillment in life. Oh, I know. I'll cheat and lie and steal for my best friends. That didn't happen. Bernie Madoff didn't think. That's his problem. Bernie Madoff emoted. I, I have a desire for that pile of money. It happens to be yours. Who cares? I'm just going to take it. Emotions are not reason. Emotions are what get you in trouble. Emotions are why you lie. You don't think and sit down and think, hmm, I think I should lie to my girlfriend today. That'll get me far in life. No, your fear, you know, some guilt, whatever it is about your emotions lead you to that. It's not about reason. Reason doesn't lead you on that path. So if you're truly self-interested, Rand argues, you don't lie, steal, cheat. You think, you reason, self-interest. Even selfishness, she's got a famous essay called the book called The Virtue of Selfishness. Because to her, selfishness means taking care of self in the deepest sense possible. Living your life to the fullest, making your life the best life that it can be. And she says the tool to do that is your mind, is your reason. And to, and to be able to use your reason, you have to be honest, you have to have integrity, you have to be just, you have to be productive. That's what your mind requires. And not just your mind. 
you know, think about happiness, right? Well, how do you, where, where does happiness come from? What makes you happy? I mean, real happiness, not the momentary honey, but, but a sustained happiness. It comes from, what? I can't hear you guys. Dopamine. Dopamine. <laughs> yeah, but what causes dopamine and serotonin to come out in a healthy human being? It's achieving stuff. It's, it's setting goals and achieving them. It's the same place where, you know, self-esteem comes from. What, you know, what's self-esteem? What do you get self-esteem from? A ribbon that somebody gives you? Everybody in the class gets the same ribbon, so you all get self-esteem, right? That's, that's modern self-esteem theory. That's why nobody has self-esteem in our culture. If we had self-esteem in our culture, do you think we'd let the TSA do what they do to us? Can you imagine George Washington going through airport security? He'd slap him. He'd slap him. Those people had self-esteem. We don't. We're like a culture of whips. Because self-esteem comes from not ribbons. It comes from what? It comes from achievement. It comes from setting goals. And it comes from self-recognition of your achievement. I am worthy. I worked hard at this. I earned this. That's where self-esteem comes from. And you cannot be happy if you don't have self-esteem. Happiness comes from that sense that I am good, I am worthy, I can live in this world, I can take care of myself. So for example, in my view, if you're a welfare recipient, you cannot have self-esteem. You're not taking care of yourself. Somebody else is taking care of you. You're dependent on other people's ability to work and set goals. I mean, welfare <coughs> is incredibly crippling to the recipient of welfare. They're the victims. Because they'll never have a job. They'll never have self-esteem. Because where do we get most of our self-esteem? Where do you sit? Well, I mean, you guys are young, but when you leave here, you'll discover very quickly that all the talk about family and all that stuff is nice talk. But where do we spend most of our time? Think of your dads, some of your moms. We spend at work. Most of our time is at work. I mean, we love our family and we devote a lot of resources to our family. The fact is that we get that high. We get that excitement, we set goals, we gain our self-esteem from work, from the work that we do. If you don't allow people to work, they will never be happy. That's why unemployment is so such a, a, a tragedy that we have high employment rates, because these people are not working, they're not taking care of themselves, they're not getting the self-esteem, and therefore they're never going to be happy. So being productive, that's a huge virtue. If you care about your own happiness, if you care about your own happiness, if you care about your own life, if you're selfish, self-interested, then you have to work. You have to make a living for yourself. And you can do all kinds of work. You can be a professor and make nothing, right? But whatever you're making, you're making. You know, a, a friend of mine who became a CEO of, of the 10th largest financial institution in the US tells the story of his grandfather. His grandfather was Brickley, dirt poor, Brickley, you know, a long time. But his grandfather worked every day, laying bricks, got paid for it, made enough money to feed himself, feed his family, send his kids to school. He had self-esteem. He was happy. He had pride. Because he knew he was taking care of his family, of the people he loved. And yeah, his grandkid became the CEO of one of the largest banks in the, in, in, in the US, right? But that's not the point. The point is that he was making it. So don't denigrate any kind of job. Any job is a good job. Because it's you supporting yourself. So self-interest in Rand's vision is a self-interest. It's about pursuing your goals. It's about pursuing your interests, doing it rationally and doing it long-term. So it's a rational, long-term self-interest. And as a consequence, it's about rationality, it's about productiveness, it's about honesty and integrity and pride. Being able to pat yourself on the back when you've achieved something. And being ambitious, wanting to be good. But know that all those virtues, that entire morality, what it means to be good, where does Bill Gates fall in that? Well, Bill Gates, when he was at Microsoft, that's when he was good. That's when he was virtuous. That's when he's a moral person. And I'm giving the money away, that's fine. 
But here we know he was good because we can see him creating stuff. We can see him building stuff. Was he taking care of himself and his family? Yes. Better than any human being on the planet ever, right? And he was benefiting everybody else at the same time. Wow. That's virtue. That's goodness. That's morality. We don't have to wait for him to retire and give it away to make him a saint. He's already a saint. He's a saint for making the money. Now, I don't know what he was like in his personal life. Who knows? But you can say, qua business life, this guy's a giant, a moral, ethical giant. Not engaged in self-destruction. He's not engaged in living for other people. He's engaged in living for himself in the fullest sense of that word, at least in business. That's what Ayn Rand is advocating for. That each of us take our lives seriously. That each of us pursue our interests rationally over the long term and with passion. And then that is what is required. That kind of moral code, that kind of morality that upholds the individual's right to his own life, that upholds you know, human happiness, individual human happiness. That is the morality, that's the moral foundation that we need to defend capitalism and to defend the standard of living and to defend freedom. We have to reject the notion that your life belongs to other people. Because that's what selflessness means. It means that from the moment you're born, you're under obligation to others. Now, how did that happen? Where did that come from? Where did the obligation come from? Where did the world, how did I become my brother's keeper? I don't remember signing that. No, reject unchosen obligations. Pursue what is truly in your rational self-interest. And the argument is if we can convince the world to be rational self-interested, then capitalism just falls into place. Because if you have self-esteem, if you want to be productive, if you want to be successful, if you want to pursue your own self-interest, what kind of political system do you want? A political system that leaves you alone. A political system that extracts the one thing. What is the one thing that can get in your way from being successful? You have restriction, coercion. People are forcing themselves on you. People are restricting your ability to pursue. Somebody sticks a gun. So my view is that force and reason are opposites. Force and reason are opposites. In the face of a gun, there's no thought. If I put a gun to your back and say 2 plus 2 from now on equals 5, and if you don't agree, I'm going to shoot you. And you have to live your life based on the idea that 2 plus 2 equals 5. You can't build a bridge. You can't build a computer. You can't do anything. Your life's over, basically. There's an undercut reality from That's what force does to the human mind. So the one thing a self-interested person wants is to live in a society where he is not coerced. He is not forced. And that's the job of government. The job of government is to extract force from society. The founders and of this country understood that. That's the whole concept of individual rights. Individual rights are the concept of freedom. You are free to live with you. When they say you have a right to life, what do they mean? You have a right to pursue the values necessary for your life. As long as you don't hurt other people, nobody has a right to hurt you. We, the government, will protect you. We, the government, will shield you from other people trying to coerce you, whether it's through physical force, whether it's through fraud, whether it's other countries trying to invade us or trying to terrorize us. That's it. So if you believe in self-interest, then you want to be left alone. You want the government to do only one thing, and that's help you be left alone. Protect you from, there are always going to be crooks, there are always going to be bad guys in society. Protect you from the bad guys, and that's it. And that's really the vision, you know, it's, I'm simplifying it a little bit because the founders were more complex than this, but that's basically what they meant by this. What they meant and they founded the country with the Declaration of Independence, which is by far the most important political document, I think, in human history. And each one of us has an inalienable right. Inalienable means what? Nobody can take it away from you. Not even a majority. Not even 99% of the people voting against you. Nobody can take it away from you. You have a right to live your life as you see fit. And in the most selfish political statement in human history, you have a right to pursue your own happiness. So if we want capitalism, if we want the standard of living capitalism in force, if we want the freedom capitalism in force, that to me is what we need to fight for. 
we need to fight for the right to pursue our own happiness. And with all the implications that has in terms of morality and in terms of economics. Thank you guys.